hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Sam de Waller. I'm from Ghent University and I'm a PhD student of uh, Stefan. Um, but I should say I am not part of the Delta project, really. That's why I'm this session talking to you about accuracy. And more specifically, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about accuracy for TFT predictions uh, of surface properties, work function and surface energy. Um, the point of this talk is not just to throw around the results and say, okay, it's this accurate, but I want to show you also a little bit about how we think uh, about errors and what kind of errors are there and how you can deal with them uh, to ultimately present your results. All right, so we're going to do a DFT accuracy study. What do we need? Uh, first of all, we need a test set. Uh, we need to decide what kind of DFT calculations are we going to do. Um, we need experimental data. This speaks for itself. And lastly, we need to analyze these errors. That's what I'm going to talk about. All right, the test set. Um, yesterday, there was a lot of discussion about test sets and what kind of material should be in there and how large should it be. So mainly, we want something that's large and diverse and that's uh, representative of a general material so we can extend our error estimates for a general material. Um, and initially, we usually end up with saying, OK, let's take this periodic table and let's ram it through the calculations. Um, OK, that's good. But there were a couple of limitations in this study. First of all, uh, the bottom one, uh, you, have to take, you have to look at the experimental data. Uh, for what materials do you have good sound experimental data with an error bar? Uh, and then you can already, yeah, you already have to leave out all of the right-hand side of the periodic table. Um, and the second part is, yeah, you can just do every surface for all the materials. We stuck to the low index uh, surfaces, thinking this would be a good enough set, so you end up with three or four per material. This is a good enough set to make a, a general statement about that material. All right. Then, the experimental data. Now, in the previous study, I, uh, the previous talk, uh, somebody said that it's good to have multiple sources. And that's very, very true. Because if you look at the experimental data for work functions, usually uh, you look at one individual publication and it says something very, very precise, like 0 0.02 electron volt on your work <laughs> function, uh, less than 1%. If you then go across a couple uh, of different publications, usually you see a spread that's about tenfold of that. So that's what we saw going through a large study by, by Kawano from 2008, uh, that in general you're talking about a 0 0.2 electron volts uh, um, experimental error bar that you have to deal with. Um, this we derived for each element separately. So for each element we had lots of data and we said, okay, this is the error bar. For those elements, for those materials, where there was only one or two uh, experimental data points, uh, we took a general error of 0 0.32. Okay. For the surface energies, this is completely different because this is not a directly observable quantity, so it's much harder to <coughs> compare. Uh, you can't really measure it experimentally directly. Uh, so you end up with these experimental derivation procedures where they start from some contact angles at a melting point, and you have to say, okay, how does this relate to my DFT calculated surface energy? Um, we took those values as they are, so a research su suggests, okay, given our procedure, these are the zero Kelvin surface energies, but what we did was we took into account a large error bar on all the procedures that they used to come up with zero Kelvin derived surface energy. So it's about 11.2%, uh, it's, size, it's size dependent, that's important. So small errors for small surface energies, large errors for large uh, surface energies. Uh, I show you later on why this is important. Okay, let's get to the main body of, of our work. And before I delve into the methodology, uh, let me show you this figure that, that Kurt came up with uh, last year. Uh, which shows you uh, a little bit about how we think about uh, errors. So on the left-hand side, the green one, you see the predictable errors. Uh, that's what uh, Pascal Pernod was talking about earlier. Uh, you, have, uh, you predict a certain value across, uh, for a large number of materials. Um, it's important that you know, okay, what is the trend across this entire test set of materials? What error can we predict for? Um, typical examples are underbinding of PBE, and then overestimation of lattice parameters, uh, parameters things like that. Um, then we have three tiers. So on the left, we have predictable. On the, rest, on the right, we have stochastic. We have three tiers. The bottom one is numeric. Numerics, think K points, uh, cutoff energies, uh, all electron versus pseudo potentials, things like that. Then the one that interests us the most um, for this study, but I guess also 
for this, uh, for this session because it's the main source of discrepancies between theory and experiment. Uh, we have PB and LEA errors. What kind of errors do these uh, levels of theory make? And then on the top, you have what's left. Uh, aside from numerics and level of theory, you have representation errors. What are uh, the discrepancies between... Uh, we are trying to describe a certain property in a computational way. Um, that's a work function or surface energy in this case. And you need to come up with a computational model. Um, the discrepancies between reality and this computational model, that's really what's in the, the representation uh, tier of, uh, of this pyramid. All right, so I said the second tier, the level of tier, is the main interest of this work, but let's try and estimate the, the, the bottom one and the top one first a little bit. Uh, this you can uh, do in large part with convergence testing. Uh, so this is generally what you do for any study, you, you, you have your um, you do your convergence testing of, of everything you can, your computational parameters, um, and you, you, you sum them up and you get to um, a general uncertainty here. So um, for work functions, we ended up with a worst case scenario of 50 millielectron volts. For surface energy, is 3%. Um, again, size dependent. These were much smaller than the experimental errors that we're going to deal with. Uh, I think two slides back. These were the experimental errors, about six, five to six times larger. So these are much smaller and are really of no significance to the statistical procedure that we're going to do to derive uh, the errors. All right, let's get to the statistics here. So we want to correct for predictable errors. Uh, you can do it in multiple cases, as, uh, as Pascal showed you. In this case, a linear regression works uh, very well. Uh, we tested a couple of other methods, but this seemed to work uh, pretty well. So you end up with a relative error and an intercept for your predictable part of the error. That's good, that's interesting, but really that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in how, what is the quality of our theory, of, of PB or LDA respectively. So then you come up with the other part of your, of your regression, namely the standard error on the regression, what's left, the cost function, how large is that? Uh, and that's really the quality of your theory. That's what's going to tell you how accurate is my, um, is my functional. Because if this would be zero, I could just make a linear scaling and I would have a perfect uh, functional for predicting surface properties. That would be great, but that's not the case. Okay, there's a slight snack in what we are trying to do. As I showed you, um, we had size dependent uh, errors for the surface energy and we had for different materials, different uh, errors for the work function. So this is what uh, statistical people call heteroscedasticity. Uh, your, error, your error varies uh, from element to element in, in our case. So how do you tackle this problem? You do uh, a weighted linear regression, where your weights are, of course, proportional to the uncertainty on the experiment. Um, OK, that's just statistic, statistics that's solved. But it has a, a rather important implication on when you're talking about the accuracy of your theory. Because the cost function, your standard error on the regression, is now not just uh, a number in electron volts or in uh, joules per square meter. It's relative to the experimental one because you have weighted to those experimental errors. So that's something you have to take into account when you do the statistical analysis uh, afterwards. All right. So if you do it, you end up with these kind of figures. I won't show all four of them. Uh, you have your regression line. Like I said, that's interesting. You can see the typical LDA. Uh, overestimation, overbinding, uh, that's happening here. You've got all your elements there. There are a couple of outliers, a couple of well-behaving things. Um, rounding them all up, um, we end up with our estimation of the predictable parts of, of our level of theory. Uh, like I said, you can get your uh, typical things you can probably predict, like uh, underestimation for PBE, overestimation for LDA. Um, the work functions for PBE have, have a nice error character. You just have to add 0.3 electron volts to them, and then you correct for a large part of the error already. So this is interesting. This, this is like more of a practical tool. Uh, it allows you to correct what you have calculated more closely to, to approximate more closely uh, the experimental value. But like I said, this is what really interests us. Interests us. Uh, just to, to give you a guide how to read these four numbers, um, if you have a square root of two, it means your experimental error is the, the one we had for our uh, experimental data points, uh, is as large as the DFT error. Um, so in the case of work functions, you can see we end up with uh, pretty great results for both functionals, actually. Uh, we can say that the experimental uh, error is larger than the DFT error. That's great news. Um, 
it becomes a bit more interesting when you look at uh, surface energies. There we see that PBE has pretty large errors. And then and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in the next slide. But first, um, you can do even more with, with analysis like these. Okay? We have now determined the statistics. Uh, we have determined the trends and we have determined the, resid the residual errors. Uh, this, this learns us a lot about, about uh, the accuracy. Um, here are some conclusions there that I told you. But uh, you can take a look at your individual errors and see if there are any outliers there. It can learn you a lot about what kind of errors are happening, where do the discrepancies lie. Uh, in the case of work functions, like I told you, work functions are, predic are predicted uh, fairly accurately with uh, density functional theory, both LDA, both PBE. But there were two uh, annoying little materials, uh, beryllium and titanium. Um, for those two, the uh, deviation between uh, DFT and experimentals was very large. And we thought long and hard about wh where is this coming from. Um, in, eventually, we had to conclude, OK, this experimental data that's out there, and the, the data was very sparse in the case of those two uh, materials. The experimental data there is probably not uh, accurate, or at least it's not accurate with how we are comparing it to uh, our DFT results. Uh, because the um, experimental data was polycrystalline, so you have like a polycrystalline sample with a lot of different facets, and 0001 is pointing out, and then you have another island with another facet. So, in those cases, we had to throw them out as outliers because the polycrystalline work functions reported in the literature and the, yeah, and, and that you could find uh, are not really comparable to the, to the DFT ones. Um, then uh, another sort of outlier analysis that you can do is look at groups that are performing badly. And I, I guess when I, told, uh, that when I told you that PBE performs very poorly, uh, for, well, very poorly, not as good as LDA in any case, for surface energies, um, you could probably guess that there was a problem happening somewhere in the periodic table. And in this case, the problem is happening right there at the, at the right-hand side of the D-block and some P-metals as well. And it turns out that for those elements where, where there's a large uh, correlation contribution, uh, you end up with uh, a severe underestimation of the surface energy uh, for PBE not for LDA, and that's why LDA performs so much better, because you have this very fortuitous cancellation of error where you have the, the overestimation of the exchange contribution, and then two problems make no wrong, apparently, and LDA predicts surface energies fairly good uh, in, for, those, uh, for those elements, at least. All right, so uh, some conclusions uh, that we could draw from this work. Uh, so both uh, PB and LDA are, are very good for work functions. Um, there really were no materials that were problematic that, that we tested, so that's good news there. Um, but for surface energies, it's a bit of a different story. The more advanced functional actually does worse, uh, but it's very material specific. And for some materials, like S-metals, for example, PBE does very well. Uh, so we, we spotted some, uh, some problematic material classes there. Um, and dissecting yeah, those, those residuals, those very large residuals, uh, really learns you a lot. And then in some cases, like for beryllium and titanium, for work functions, it even allows you to just throw out some experimental data points that you're not happy with, of course, on very good statistical grounds. OK, uh, thank you very much for your attention.